你好，对不起，我的中文说的不好。And and we thank you for your kindness in letting us com,、uh, continue in English. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today here to the practical lessons from building a highly available OpenStack private cloud. One thing、uh, right off the bat: all of the presentation slides, because people are always asking for presentation slides, will obviously be available on the conference website later to, to tonight, whenever the organizers actually upload them. And each of you is very much invited to use these presentation slides for any purpose you wish, under the terms of the Creative Commons BSA 3.0 license, which means you can use them for anything you want. As long as you quote your source,、um, let me start by、uh, introducing to you Sebastian Kachel. Sebastian Kachel is one of the folks on the OpenStack team at、uh, Pixel Park. I've had the pleasure to work with Sebastian and the rest of their very very sharp team for、uh, several months now, and、uh, Sebastian is based in Berlin, Germany, and this is. As about two thirds of the people in the keynote this morning, his very first、uh, OpenStack summit, so we can count him as a very new addition to our large and growing OpenStack community. And this is Florian. Florian is、uh, HA Storage Cloud Guy Consultant and Instructor. He is、um, the Stexo co-founder and CEO. Based on C10C economy class, <laughs> Ossa Sinelli returns based home near Vienna in Austria. So, what was the challenge to solve? We answer、um, the services that we provide with high availability, and so we must do this in our private cloud too. And、uh, this is actually something that is a very typical challenge in the OpenStack community. Generally speaking,、uh, OpenStack users fall in one of two different groups.、Uh, one group is the one that is primarily looking to OpenStack as a massively scalable cloud platform for maybe a handful of applications that they are building. This is kind of like the, the group or the company or the team that is trying to build the next Twitter. Um, or something of that nature that has equal scalability needs.、Uh, what these people have in common is they typically have the luxury of maintaining only a handful of applications, which they can re-engineer if they so choose at essentially any given point of time. And the only constraints that they have are maybe time and budget. And then there's a wholly different group that looks for OpenStack, looks at OpenStack as a modern way of running a data center. And there, you typically don't have the luxury of having maybe half a dozen applications that you、uh, support, but maybe half a thousand or more than that. And、uh, in the first group, you have this luxury of if I want high availability in my application, I can build it into the application or into the handful of applications that I'm running, and then I don't care whether my cloud infrastructure itself provides high availability or not. If, however, I'm running OpenStack as a way to run a modern data center, then I do have the expectation that my cloud infrastructure provides at least a certain degree of high availability, simply because I'm not in any way capable of re-engineering a thousand or maybe more applications that I am managing. And、uh, as Sebastian is going to explain to us in a moment. Pixel Park, the company that he works for, very firmly falls into the second category. So they're very much looking for an OpenStack infrastructure that can provide this high availability to them, so they don't have to worry about it at the, at the individual virtual machine, the guest level. Yes. So we are the different thing, and we must bring the HA in the infrastructure. So let me take a little one about、um, Pixel Park. So Pixel Park is a full-service agency for multimedia communication and e-business solutions, with the following departments like concepts, project management, editorial, design, developing, and hosting. So today we will show you the solution how we built HA in our private cloud. 
So why we use OpenStack? There are so many other cloud softwares. And I explained we are a full service agency. So we need the benefits of cloud computing, like on demand, scalable, elastic. We, it's very good that OpenStack has fixed time-based release cycles. It is open source, so we don't must um, pay for a license. We can get support. It has a rapid development. And this is a very important thing is that OpenStack is a cloud software <coughs> that goes beyond infrastructure as a service. So for a full service agency with development as a department, it's very important for us because they can use it for platform as a service and we can can provide the services for the other departments. And we make, or you, we can make it highly available. So why we should use it high available? I said that the other services that we have on, on physical machines that we provide, um, the services high available. And we must do this in, in, in our private cloud too. So in detail, we provide service level agreements um, up to 4.9. So when we talk about 4.9's availability, um, that's obviously less than an hour of cumulative downtime per year. The important part uh, here is that if you have a, an SLA that mandates this kind of uptime, um, then that means if you're thinking uh, you can handle outages by having a person on call and you page them and then they log in and they fix it. Um, and you still think that you're going to be a, able to achieve four nines over the average of a year or maybe two years. Um, you need to think again. That doesn't quite work that way. Um, if, you are, if you are under an SLA that provides four nines capability, or even 99.95% capability, you are going to have some automated fashion of recovering from failures. That is to say, you do actually need to build some form of automated high availability, automated failover into your system. If you're thinking anything else, if you're thinking you can uh, guarantee a four nines availability SLA without some form of high availability mechanisms, you're on the wrong track. So really, very important stuff. Um, you actually need to build automated failover solutions into your infrastructure if you need to maintain an SLA just like this. And this is a very, very common uh, criterion for a hosting provider, for a private cloud. There's very few customers that will accept less. Um, and uh, so for anyone who's building a private cloud, that is an, absolute, uh, an absolutely important concern. So, how did we do this HA in, in OpenStack? First, I will start on the base of the system, and uh, this is storage. So, we need uh, 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 high available storage, and it must be scalable. And so, we use Ceph. Ceph is a distributed storage plat platform designed for excellent performance, reliability, and scalability. So it guarantees reliable storage with no data lost. So what we should uh, store in, 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 in the self cluster, I think or rethink, um, all it's impossible. Uh, so we store cinder volumes, glance images, static data, over Raiders Gateway and the three, and we store instance data. So Ceph is an excellent storage, cloud storage for us. So how did we build it? You can configure Ceph or you can configure the copies of data um, in Ceph, and we are working with three copies. So 66% of the physical nodes um, can, can crash, and all data is available with three copies. 
we used one disk per OSD. So under the, the, the OSD is no write. They are standalone because you don't need it. Over the OSDs is a XFS file system. And we put the journaling on separate solid state disk because it's faster. Every storage node has eight gigabyte ports in trunk mode because you have fast connectivity to these storages. And uh, most of these are just basically pretty much standard best practices for any, uh, for any Ceph cluster. Um, can we have a quick show of hands, please? Who in here has built a Ceph cluster either in testing or production at some point? So as we can see, the technology as such is getting traction because when I first asked this about uh, two summits ago, there were significantly fewer people in the room that would raise their hand. Um, so this is a relatively cookie cutter, straightforward um, Ceph OSD configuration. Um, this uh, is using the XFS file system as a sort of a, a balance, a trade-off between file system features and file system stability. Um, if you want uh, the best optimized uh, file system for the Ceph uh, store as such for the Ceph uh, OSDs, you will probably go with ButterFS. But then you might be the kind of person that says, well, ButterFS is two years away from production and has always been and will always be, but only if you're cynical. Uh, but I think we all agree that uh, ButterFS is currently in an experimental state, so XFS as an OSD for production system is generally a really, really good trade-off between performance on the one hand and um, stability and reliability uh, on the other hand. Uh, this whole thing with one disk per OSD, um, one thing that's nice about Ceph clusters is um, it takes care of all of the data redundancy for you. That is to say, uh, you can run your Ceph OSDs on simple JBODs, so you don't really worry about RAID controllers or that kind of stuff anymore. And the part with the journaling on a separate SSD is a... Uh, is essentially a performance consideration. Um, Ceph, when used uh, with XFS, uses write-ahead journaling, which means that all writes first go to a journal. That determines your write latency, and then later on they actually go to the actual file store. Um, so if your journal is reasonably fast, such as when you're running an enterprise SSD, um, that generally speeds up the performance uh, of your uh, Ceph cluster as a whole. So like I said, all of these are sort of general best practice um, recommendations that most people choose to follow when they deploy uh, Ceph with the XFS file system. So this is the storage. The next layer I will explain is the OpenStack block storage. So this is Cinder. The Cinder um, services are Cinder Volume, Cinder API, Cinder Schedule. And we put it into Pacemaker. So Pacemaker monitor and control these services over these two nodes. The services are running in active backup mode. That means they are only running on one node, all services. And when one service crashed, <coughs> Pacemaker moved it to, an, to the other node. The, the connectivity the network connectivity to these um, uh, storage gateways um, is four gigabyte ports in trunk mode. The reason why it's actually relatively simple to put these uh, services under a uh, pacemaker high availability manager is that when used in conjunction with Ceph RBD, so that's the RADOS block device that Cinder uses here for backend storage, the services themselves are essentially stateless. So the services themselves don't keep any local state about themselves anywhere except in uh, the relational database that they write their persistence, uh, persistent data into. Um, the RabbitMQ or AMQP in general message queues that are used to communicate between the services and the actual data lives in the Ceph store itself. So that means uh, failing over a service, a Cinder service, a Cinder API scheduler, um, or a Cinder volume service is a relatively simple process of just firing up the processes, the services themselves. There is nothing that we need to worry about in terms of actually getting the state over. 
because the services as such are inherently stateless. So that makes the failover actually very clean and very fast. And uh, specifically in um, conjunction with Ceph RBD, that's a very elegant solution. That is not necessarily true for all Cinder backends. So for example, if you're using the standard um, LVM-backed iSCSI uh, Cinder backend, that is significantly more involved because then you do have local state that you do need to fail over. But uh, for Ceph RBD, that's actually a really nice and elegant combination that fails over very cleanly and very nicely. So this was uh, the second layer, block storage. The next layer is network. So let's have a look at this. Um, we put the services on Pacemaker 2 because it's very good and Pacemaker monitor it and when the service crashed, um, Pacemaker moved it automatically. So we must do nothing. The Quantum DHCP agent is um, configured in active-active mode. So um, you must set a, um, a parameter in the quantum server and um, this um, is very good. The L3 agent is in active backup mode because we have trouble in Grizzly release to run this on multi-host in active-active mode. So it's running on one server and when it's crashed, it's um, crashed it moved to the, in, to the other. The open vSwitch agent you can run in active active mode. So a few additional words about the then quantum now neutron uh, open vSwitch uh, plugin agent. What Pixel Park is using in this configuration is uh, the OVS plugin in Jiri tunnel mode. So in other words, uh, the reason or the consequence of this being all in active active mode is we permanently have these tunnels established between all of the compute nodes and the network node. So in effect, it's one gigantic virtual switch or actually one gigantic virtual switch per tenant that we can then just plug VMs into. Um, that is an infrastructure that basically lives all the time. When uh, a compute node happens to crash and we need to bring up uh, the specific or a specific set of guests on a different node, which is what we're going to talk to uh, in about in just a second, that compute node has access to the same virtual switch, i.e. the same set of GRE tunnels. And all of that is managed very nicely and automatically by the quantum uh, open vSwitch plugin agent, or as it would be called in the present Havana release, the neutron open vSwitch plugin agent. So this is um, the third layer, the network layer. <clears throat> the next layer is services and APIs. So we put it in Pacemaker 2 because it's very good. And we, the services are distributed. So Horizon is running on control node 1, quantum server on, on control 2, and something like this. And the important is that we put MySQL and RabbitMQ in uh, DRBD. So you have one primary DRBD mounted on, for example, control node one. And the second one is in um, secondary state. So the primary sync the data to the primary. And when one service crashed, like um, MySQL, Pacemaker, move the services, the IP from MySQL, mount the DRBD and start the MySQL service on the other node. One thing that applies here is there's more than one way to do it. You don't necessarily need to do this with DRBD. Another option would have been to use another separate RBD volume out of the Ceph cluster. Uh, and another option would also have been to use replication facilities built into the applications themselves. Um, MySQL, the MySQL database engine offers uh, Galera, which uses write set replication in a multi-master node between multiple nodes. In, um, on the RabbitMQ side, there, uh, we could have been using uh, mirrored queues in RabbitMQ. DBD was chosen here for reasons of simplicity and stability, but not necessarily because it is the one true option that you can use to deploy here. Like I said, 
there is more than one way to do this. Another thing that should be mentioned is that most of these services uh, can be run in both an active-passive and an active-active configuration. So for example, the um, Nova and Quantum API services would be classic examples of services that can run in multiple instances on multiple nodes. The nice thing about the Pacemaker cluster stack is it enables us to do that very nicely as well. In Pacemaker, we can define a cluster resource as what is called a clone. And in that, we can essentially say, um, give me four instances of Nova API. I don't care on which of the, net, uh, of the nodes in this set of, say, for example, eight nodes you run them, uh, but give me four instances of them. Um, so we can use Pacemaker features here for both classic failover high availability and also for a certain amount of scale out. And then can that be combined with a load balancer like HA proxy or other things as well. So you see it's a Pacemaker cluster with two nodes to keep Horizon, Keystone, Glance, Nova, RabbitMQ, Quantum Server, and the MySQL database always on. So this is the services on API layer. The next and last layer in our infrastructure is compute. So we use a pacemaker cluster. <laughs> and um, the special thing is that the instances are running in the Ceph cluster. So we mount it over, over RBD under the standard default pass while um, lib nova instances. Um, we create our own pool in the self cluster. So you should um, don't use a too large pool, um, like five terabytes or something like this. Um, I don't know why, but it is better to use a smaller because um, the, the, the fright and I.O. process are not good in our environment. Um, <laughs> And um, that it is fast, you or we need um, six one gigabyte ports in trunk mode. Again, here the same thing applies that I said earlier. There is more than one way to do it. What anyone uh, that is familiar with, with Nova realizes from this immediately is that because the stuff that normally holds the ephemeral data, the throwaway data for virtual machines, is itself on persistent storage, there's no such thing as ephemeral storage. Everything, by default, is persistent. Um, you could also employ a strategy where you're saying, by default, everything is not persistent. And when you want a whole virtual machine to be persistent, you have to boot off of a cinder volume. That is perfectly supported in Nova. And one other thing that um, you may be wondering about is why use an RBD mount of varlib nova instances when, uh, that you then have to put under pacemaker management and things like that when you could just use um, the Ceph file system and mount everything directly. Again, that is a trade-off um, in terms of stability. The Ceph file system is considered experimental at this point. The downside of actually mounting an RBD with uh, two, uh, and that is available to multiple compute nodes is you have to use some sort of high availability manager to do that. In Pixel Park case, Pixel Park's case, that HA manager is already there, and it's just an additional resource that you plug into it. So that makes it uh, very simple. An alternative case for using exactly this thing is Sebastian. Could you please raise your hand real quick? Sebastian An, who's in the fifth row here, has written a very interesting blog post on how to do this with CephFS. So that's another alternative approach uh, to, to doing that. So this is our full um, HA open stack. stack. <laughs> and the last thing that I will say is, how did OpenStack affect our organization? Let me just and quickly add one more thing. What this actually means, just in case it's not 100% clear, is that you can actually kill a compute node, and the virtual machines will come up on a backup compute node on a secondary compute node. So you've actually got your fully persistent, highly available virtual machines, um, which is something that, unfortunately, you can't really do with onboard components in OpenStack. So it's not something that's actually built into Nova itself. 
but it is something that you can build uh, using a high availability manager that interacts with OpenStack. So in this case, you can actually kill a compute node and the virtual machines that are on that compute node will all fail over to another one and will continue to live there and be available for you, which is kind of like what you want in a data center infrastructure. So the question was, is that four separate two-node pacemaker clusters? Yes, it's separate, it's, it's separate pairs, yeah. But with the option of obviously, you know, for example, the compute cluster you can easily extend, but yeah, you get the idea. I mean, Tim works on this stuff, so he gets the idea anyway, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that was just a rhetorical figure of speech. We had another question back here? Okay, yes, the question was, if you kill a compute node and you bring a, a compute node back up, someone has to take care of starting the virtual machines on that node. Nova actually does take care of that. Um, we have a Nova option that's called uh, resume, guest, uh, resume guest state on host boot, which means you bring up the, the host. Um, it will then check in the database, okay, which are the machines that are supposed, supposed to be running on that node and check that against the local libvirt state and whatever is not running will get fired up. And the only little trick that you need to play is uh, you need to override the host name that goes into the Nova database with an opaque host name and for that you have the host parameter in nova.com. So that's the whole, whole trickery around that. So how did this our organization? <clears throat> to implementing an OpenStack environment is a challenge. And it's a well, very good uh. way <laughs> to get training before you uh, install OpenStack and get support when you have a live environment. So now we enter quality, we work efficiently, we have a, program, a programmable infrastructure and this creates a basic for further innovation because we can um, test software or infrastructure in OpenStack in minutes and then we destroy it. And we are ready for up and coming um, technologies and now we sponsor an OpenStack user group. And the important thing for, for operators, it makes a lot of fun to work with it. And I had a lot of fun, I and my team had a lot of fun working with these guys as well because they were really, really sharp and nice to work with. Um, if you have further questions, you can of course ask them immediately after, uh, but I realize uh, that there is apparently, according to rumors, there's people with beers wait, waiting outside. Um, but by all means, please, uh, if you do have questions, uh, get in touch. Uh, Basti's address, uh, email address is right there. Mine is at the bottom. It's very simple. First name dot last name at company dot com. So Sebastian dot Kachel at pixelpark.com. And mine is uh, Florian dot Haas at Pastexo dot com. Uh, we can, you can also find our company websites, obviously, uh, at uh, pixelpark.com and Pastexo dot com. And uh, you can also find us on Google+, and you can find us on Twitter and wherever, and you can find us, obviously, in the attendee directory for this, um, uh, for this conference. And uh, with that, um, we will be happy to take your questions. Um, but before that, let us quickly say, <laughs>